Okay, so let's turn with me in your Bibles, if you have it with you, to Ruth chapter 4. We're concluding our story this week. Uh, I could have gone for another couple of weeks. We just haven't got time. Um, maybe we'll come back to another time. Um, there's always a sadness finishing a book. I just don't like finishing a book, do you? Any kind of book. Um, and actually, I saw a cartoon, um, and someone was laying on the floor, and they were their head down, and they were crying. And I said, someone said, what's wrong with you? He said, oh, my life has ended. And I said, well, well, what's happened? He said, I've just finished my book, and I don't know what to do next. <laughs> and, and you know, I feel like that often when I'm reading a book. I just don't like finishing a book. And... Uh, and the same is with a study as well. So Ruth chapter 4. But before we read it, let's give you the theme. The theme I've put to it today is the road to doing the right thing isn't always straight. Sorry, the road to doing right is not always straight, but God has got a plan. Okay? So the road to doing right is not always straight, but God has got a plan. Okay. So arriving in chapter 4 of Ruth, it's actually a very good place to ask some questions. Well, what's the point of the book? What's the purpose of the book? What can we learn? Well I, well, I hope you've learned some things and you've taken some things away in these past weeks. But you know, Ruth here in the Old Testament is a little bit like James in the New Testament. Because actually, it's intensely practical in the way it expresses the experience of someone's life. And actually, many theologians dislike this book just like they dislike James because they don't have the statements on which they can build doctrine. Okay, you see the problem with being cerebral without a practical application is that doctrine becomes absolutely meaningless. If we're to think prophetically, remember the rock in the pool, past, present and future, we need to consider that a major difficulty encountered by the Christian church, and I would say particularly the evangelical church, in the past, definitely in the present, most certainly in the future, is that we've tended to spiritualize most things to the point where we become stuck. And I often refer to this as a fundamentalism with a, a big F, okay? or a theology of the page that takes the written word without considering context and or a reasonable transposition of truth. And we become so bound by that that we become stuck in our religion. And that's the way we've always done it. And in the process, we've lost the capacity to discern God's will for our life, which actually was what the Reformation was all about in the first place and what subsequent Reformations are meant to be about. Every believer having the right to discern God's word and will for him or herself. Now, the tough bit of that and the application of that is that we have the responsibility individually and collectively to read and pray and discern and act upon the truth. And that becomes even tougher when our views differ and the debate and dialogue become necessary and essential. And I'm sure you've been in churches and in those church meetings where my way is the only way and this is what God says. And if God says it, that's the way it's done. You know, if pews were good enough for the Apostle Paul, we're going to have pews in our church. You know, that was the kind of attitude that seems to be promoted. But dialogue and continued learning is so essential if we're going to apply the truth of God's word. If we're going to be fundamental in our understanding of what God has to say to us. What does Paul say? Say it with me. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable service or your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's, God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. You see, what happens there, there's an application to it. There's a statement, there's a mandate, but there's an application to it. And that happens all the way through God's word. And that's where you get doctrine from. Doctrine is something that's got to work and evolve and change as we go on, as we apply it to our life. Now, God's will is clearly discerned in the process of life, in the reading of his word, and interpreting and reinterpreting as we mature and as we develop. In other words, we don't stand still. So as we travel God's word day by day, we should see something new. Hands up if you never learn anything by reading God's word. Right, okay. Well, the point made. You see, you just cannot live on the same measure of grace that you received when you trusted Jesus as your saviour. And so it's impossible to live on some of the understanding of the scriptures that you discerned at new birth. And, you know, 
That's the reason why we journey regularly through the scripture. And, you know, I personally shudder at some of the things I was taught when I first became a Christian by well-meaning people. I mean, one of the first lessons I was taught was, right, we have a Ten Commandments, okay? And here's another ten things that you're not allowed to do. So no pictures, no dancing, no going to the pub. You know, what? You know, my life ended, you know. <laughs> God did change me, and certainly my abattoir of jokes went, but the fact is he cleaned my life up, and that God was working in me, but I wasn't able to move, so I was suddenly stuck at this point. I'd become a Christian, I was on the starting blocks, I was ready to go, and they said, ah, no, but you can't go that way, you can't go that way, you can't go that way. But if you go around there and up there, and you read that and you do that, you know, and that's how it becomes, it becomes legalistic, doesn't it? You see, the difference is I've grown spiritually, well, I hope I have, and I've engaged a bit of sanctified common sense to the equation of interpretation. And that doesn't affect our understanding of the fundamentals in regard to the authority of scripture, for example. It's historicity or the inerrancy of God's word. I believe in those things. It doesn't affect my understanding of the personal work of the Godhead in our salvation, which is by faith alone through grace alone. Oh, there's some doctrine coming out today, eh? Simply, it's clear that God gave us a mind and he gave us a creativity that should reflect his image. And he wants us to use them for his honour and not our own honour. That's the difference. That's true evolution. Feeling safe, existing in a theological camp, that actually is religion. It's not a full-blooded relationship with Jesus participating in the divine nature, which we are meant to do. Otherwise become a bunch of automatons. How boring is that? You know, safety under his wing, Psalm 91, we talked about that a lot recently, haven't we, is about assurance of salvation. Theological safety, if there is such a thing, is not about being comfortable. So I was talking to someone this week who was talking about someone else in the church that they're going to, and they're really quite strict, this church, you know, very reformed. And they have an understanding of scripture and then there's no wiggle room at all. You see, it's not about being comfortable. It's about engaging with God's word and in turn engaging with others, not necessarily on our own terms. And this means that often on this journey, we have to actually step out of our comfort zone. We have to be open to learn in a way that we're not used to, or maybe we have to learn in a way that we don't enjoy or maybe even like. But that's the point, isn't it? What is Isaiah says? My thoughts, are not, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. Who said we've got the monopoly on the truth just because it works for us? Does that make it right? The moment we fall into arrogance and decide that this is it's my way or no way, and let's face it, we've all been there, we've actually moved into the Naomi camp Losing sight of the blessing of the present and the future simply because we're stuck in the past. Now the book of Ruth engages us in this way. It proves that in the lives of ordinary people, God is at work and that he has got a plan for our good. But also that the road to right living is not straight and simple. But it's one that requires a constant navigation and decision making with signs of encouragement to read along the way. And in the end, well, there's always the glory of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I love to go on an adventure. In fact, I said that to you yesterday, didn't I? I need an adventure. I just love to have a week just to go. On. I'm not saying I'm taking a week off to do this, by the way. But I'd love to have a week where I decide on a route across the hills and I just go for a week. You know, I just have to navigate. It's amazing what you see. You can read all the books you like, but there's nothing like having boots on the ground. There's nothing like holding your compass and saying, well, that tree wasn't on my map, you know. There's nothing like standing in a bog up to your knees in water and saying, I'm sure I went the right way. There's nothing quite like it. I know it sounds awful, but, you know, that's part of the adventure. And that is exactly how our Christian walk's meant to be. It's meant to be a great adventure. Oh, you don't look like you're enjoying the adventure very much. <laughs> Get your boots, your spiritual boots on. Get out there. Start moving. Don't try and be comfortable. Catching the bus is not that good. You always feel you haven't completed the walk. The book of Ruth is one of these signs for us to read on this journey. 
He's here to enable us on the journey of faith and to demonstrate that although life might appear to be a bit of a dead-end road, if our life is in God's hands, then there's a purpose in it all. And eventually, we will see the point. Now, that might not be till we get to heaven, but we will see the point. What's it Martin Luther says? I've held many things in my hands and I've lost them all. But everything I've placed into God's hands, that I still possessed. Submission to God, submission to each other, and then all will, men will know that we are Jesus' disciples by our love for one another. And that's the point of being a body, isn't it? Loving the unlovely and getting on with that person who gets right up your nose. You know, so far, this story has been a story of setbacks. Chapter 1, the journey back from Moab, it's been a devastating time for us. Then in chapter 2, there's a new hope on the horizon because Boaz appears on the scenes. The timing is perfect again. Naomi seems to be over the worst of a difficult journey home. And she's beginning to see something of God at work as she identifies Boaz as a possible husband for Ruth. Boaz befriends and cares for Ruth and appears to be sending out all kinds of messages. But he doesn't make any move. He doesn't take any advantage. And the encounter builds the suspense and the reader is left wondering whatever's going to happen next. And certainly I'm glad that the rest of the book doesn't read like one of those novels that you get. You know, in a high adventure novel, you're reading through and you get to that point and it's a crucial cliffhanger. And you turn the pace in the next chapter and they introduce another character. What is that about? And you've got to go through another couple of chapters before you get the next bit of the story. But you can't skip them to get there because you know it make. And so if you're like me, you read in bed. And you think, look at the clock, say, oh, I'll just, I just get through these next chapters. And I'll read till three o'clock in the morning to get to that next point. And then the next day I've got to read it again because I actually didn't get it all in the first place. Last time in chapter three, Naomi and Ruth have clearly been thinking over the apparent subtle messages that Boaz has been sending to them. And I proposed last time that they devised a plan that was symbolic in action but honourable in meaning as Ruth goes to Boaz in the middle of the night and accepts his proposal of marriage, although she probably told him, remember that? And we concluded the scene with the honourable Boaz confirming that Ruth had read the message clearly and he was grateful that God had helped her to see that, but he recognised that he didn't have first claim as a kinsman redeemer. But he promises that he's going to go and sort the situation out at first opportunity. And it seems like there's another setback coming our way. But there is romance and there's more suspense. Great writing, isn't it? Then we come to chapter 4. Let's read it together. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he'd mentioned came along, Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Now Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, and, I'll, and I will, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I'm the next in line. I'll redeem it, said it, he said. Then Boaz says, he's very wise, isn't he? On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabites, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead man, the, the name of the dead with his property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, then I can't redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I can't do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Limanek, Kilion, and Machlon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabites, Machlon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family, Often the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all of those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring of the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez 
whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Then he went to her and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he, be, he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better than you, to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on the lap and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Aminadab. Aminadab the father of Nashon. Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz. Boaz the father of Obed. Obed the father of Jesse. And Jesse the father of David. So, after Midnight Rendezvous, chapter 3, Boaz goes to the city gate where his official business is going to be done. The nearer kinsman arrives, Boaz, and Boaz lays the situation before him. Naomi is given up the property she's got, and the duty of the near kinsman is to buy the inheritance so it stays in the family. Now the reader at this point is sitting in the background, and you can hear the voice, Don't buy it! Don't buy it! You want it to go in one direction, don't you? And then bang, the man says, OK, I'll buy it. And we're all left wondering, if only Boaz had not done the right thing and just bought the land and married Ruth, that would have made life an awful lot easier. That's probably what we would have done, to be honest. But actually, the kinsman is only doing what's right, despite the frustration. He didn't know about Ruth, okay, at this point. Or he chose to ignore it. And I'm always fascinated, you know, with human behaviour. If we can't have life our own way, generally we change the situation and make it our way, don't we? We manipulate and we manoeuvre. And do you know what we do then? This is where we spiritualise it. We then get what we want and say, praise our Lord, look what he's given me. But we've manoeuvred ourselves into the situation. You know, at the response of the kinsman, we're at the point of saying, look, just stop the story here. Things are going really well. Just stop it while there's a happy end in sight. But you know something? The right way does seem a bit longer, but it's still the right way. Then Boaz says, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, verse 5, and from Ruth the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. So the tension builds, doesn't it? And then the response at this he says, I can't do that. You know, it might endanger my own estate. And we don't know why it would have done. It might be because his wife would never allow a younger woman into the house. Okay? It could be that she's from Moab and there's some racial tension there. It might be because there was bad blood with Naomi in the first place. We just don't know. So you're going to have to go away and think about that one for yourself. But then in verses 7 through 12, we see Boaz filling his promise honourably. He gets everything bang on. He knows what he wants and he goes for it. It's a bit like that story in the Gospels. You know the man who finds a, pearl, a treasure in a field, finds a pearl, and instead of just taking it in, he goes away and buys the field and then claims it for his own. And this is exactly what's happening here. He knows the treasure that's there. It's not about the land. The other kinsman redeemer saying, yeah, I'll take it off, I'll help out. I'll take it. It's going to add to his lands, isn't it? But the real treasure for Boaz is the love that he feels for Ruth. This is God's plan for him. And it seems like a happy ending, but there's still one thing to be resolved before the book can close. Ruth hasn't got any children. She's barren and in her last marriage and she needed to have an heir. And we can see that the path of right living before God is not easy in the situation and it appears another setback is on the horizon. Now if it were to end there, we would be forgiven if we felt that it wasn't fair because we wanted to see how it worked out. I think, do you ever get to the end of a film or a book and say... Well, what happened then? You know? This isn't just a great story, you know. This is a, a glimpse into the lives of real people who struggle with real issues. It was a period of the judges with all the upheaval of the time. They struggled with racial tensions. There was intolerance. There were polit political differences. There were wars. There were many homeless. Too many were widows and needed to be cared for by their relatives. Folk were struggling against poverty and hunger. And do you know what? If they had petrol, that would have been expensive as well. Does it all sound familiar? 
And just a, a glimpse into one situation that was a common occurrence, God reveals himself, and what he does actually is lifts the pilgrim's chin and makes him look heavenward to show you that regardless of the circumstances you're in, there is hope. And then look at verse 13, it's lovely. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Then he went to her and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. But notice here the focus changes again. Look at verse 14 to 17. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on the lap and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now we know biologically this was the son of Ruth and Boaz, but he's referred to as the son of Naomi. And this proves the point that her feelings of desolation and loss that she used for the sympathy vote right back in chapter 1 were just not true. Remember, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. God's will has gone against me and he's afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And she just heaped it on to get it, didn't it? You see, the same is true of us, exactly the same. If we would just learn to wait and trust God, all of our complaints will prove to be centred on our wants and our greeds rather than his glory and our needs. See, the book of Ruth was written to help us to see the signposts of grace, of the grace of God in our lives and to help us to, to trust him and unlock his grace even when the blizzard that we're passing through is so fierce that we can't see the road, let alone the signs and the sight. We need to go back time and time again and remind ourselves that it was God who acted to turn back setbacks into stepping stones of joy and that it is God who, in all the tough times, who is ever there providing for the good. So let's do a little brief recap. Firstly, when Naomi's whole life seemed to cave in while she was in Moab, it was God who gave her Ruth. Despite the efforts of Naomi in the past, it was God that touched Ruth's life. And so it was to God that Naomi owed the love of this girl who gave up everything to be her companion. Then in chapter 2, it was clear that in staying with Naomi, Ruth had taken refuge under God's wings. Throughout the story, from the seeming disaster and from the brink of despair, God had been there for Naomi, even though in the darkest time she was oblivious to his presence. Secondly, all the, time, all the while that it seemed there was no hope of the family line continuing, God had preserved not one, but two kinsmen redeemers that we're aware of. There may have been more. And even though there may have been bad blood in the past, God provided a future and the possibilities were that pride might have to be swallowed, but God had provided the means. Are we seeing a pattern here? Thirdly, there is light at the end of the, light at the, end of the story as it dawns as Naomi sees the chance meeting of Boaz and Ruth, and we see God's hand on it. The Lord bless him, she says. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. And then she added, that man's our close relative. He's one of our kinsmen redeemers. It's almost like a light goes on in her head, doesn't it? And suddenly she's seeing God's willingness. She's actually beginning to take stock of all the different things that have been happening on this journey. And suddenly, you know he's one of our kinsmen redeemers. So you can see it. A work in a while there, can't you? Fourthly, God enabled Ruth to conceive so that the people could see the hand of God in his family and the deliverance of Naomi and Ruth from loss and poverty. And it provided them with hope because they could see the reality of God. And this in turn produces worship. Look at verse 11. Then the elders and all at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah who together built up the house of Israel. And may you have standing in Ephrathah and, and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Oh, what a beautiful prayer. And what we see is the recognition of God at work. Knowing that Ruth is barren, they pray that her experience will be like that, the union between Jacob and Rachel and Leah. And Rachel, of course, had been barren. 
And through these women, God had provided the people a promise. And through Ruth, there's a longing that that will continue. And it proves the point that we made at the very outset of our studies that we don't need to have a romantic picture of the personalities in Scripture. They're just like us. In the will of God, they've achieved extraordinary things in spite of themselves. And that should really give us a great encouragement, you know, because often we're down on ourselves. But God has got a purpose. See, the road to right living in the sight of God is not always straight, but he proves his love every step of the way. And if the story were to end there, with this proud granny cuddling her new grandson, remembering her husband and her boys, we would be missing something else. Verse 16, look, then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. You know, the reader is suddenly transported to the point of realizing that something greater than we could ever imagine has happened. The temporal blessings for these folk are there. It's great to see. But through these insignificant folk, God is preparing the way for the greatest king that Israel had ever seen, King David. And then through his line to see the Messiah. And that's why we're here. This is not just a, a stream of hope in the desert. This is a river that's bringing life to humanity. How contemporary is that? When with modern day politics, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. When the potential and the promise and value of individuals is measured by qualifications and the assets that they hold. Now, whilst things and their stewardship are important, they should merely just be a means to an end. And here is where the Christian church is meant to be so different, so much more. We're meant to see the value in the individual and understand that we all fit together as a functioning body with our equality of worth in the eyes of God, but recognising that at the same time, all of us have different roles that are meant to complement each other. We are individually and together the people of promise. We are the people of God. Now the book of Ruth... He wants to teach us that God's purpose for life, for the life of us, his people, is to connect to something that's far, far greater than ourselves. God wants us to know that when we follow him, our lives will always mean more than we think they do. For the Christian, there's always a connection between the ordinary events of life and the incredible work of God in history. Everything we do in obedience to God, no matter how small, is significant because it's part of a cosmic mosaic which God is placing to display the greatness of his power and tell us of his wisdom to the world and the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. The deep satisfaction of the Christian life is that it's not given over to trivialities. So, serving a widowed mother-in-law Gleaning in a field, falling in love, having a baby. For the Christian, all these things are connected to eternity. They're part of something so much bigger than they seem. So don't lose heart, Christian. If you feel that you're groping round in the darkness, God has got a plan. And that's got to give you hope. Let's pray together, shall we? We thank you, our Father, that even in the ordinariness of our lives, that you have involved and you have so much more to do in our lives. Do you want us to really understand and that our lives are significant and everything we do and the way that we think, the way that we act is important and linked to eternity? And so today, as we've concluded this book, we're sad that we've concluded this story at this point, but we thank you for the encouragement that it's been as we've seen you at work in ordinary circumstances and the way that you've changed people from feeling that they were lost to understanding that they are full and that you can provide the blessing if only they would trust you. So help us to do the same, we pray. 
Help us to read the signs clearly. Help us to move on the adventure of our faith journey. And to understand that you have given us a mind to think with. That you've given us a creativity to appreciate who you are. And that you want us to be the very best that we can be. We want you to have all the glory. So, Lord, we commit our lives into your hands once again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.